And uh, this was under a piece of glass. Uh, everybody else was looking around, looking at tiaras and gold and diamonds. And I could care less about tiaras and gold and diamonds. Uh, I was standing over this thing, and uh, I, was, I was translating it. And uh, some of you might know 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 contains what's called a Granville Sharp construction. It's one of the evidences of the deity of Christ, where Jesus is called our great God and Savior. And so I was, I was translating that, and people would come up. I had a friend with me, the uh, president of Alpha Omega Ministries, Rich Pierce, was standing there. And people would come up, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, see, see there's a nomina sacra, there's this. And, and they'd sort of look down at that, and they'd look up at the description, and they'd look over at my friend, they'd go, can, can he read that? And my friend would go, yeah. And he said, Ralph, come over here. This man's reading this ancient writing over here, you know. <laughs> so all these people... So all these people start gathering around, you know, and the, 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 the security people are like, what's going on over there? So Rich would drag me off someplace, go look at a gold tiara for a while, and then I'd go back again. And, you know, and uh, it, was, oh, it, was, it, was, it was fantastic because here is a, a manuscript. Now remember something, folks. I'm going to start preaching here. I'm sorry, but remember something. The church is under persecution at this time. The man who wrote this manuscript risked his life to do it. Now, you look at it, that man was not a professional scribe. This is probably just a business person. Uh, might have been a slave, for all we know. He's probably traveling around. He comes into a fellowship, and they're reading from this, and, and he doesn't know what they're reading from. So he asks them, well, these are, these are uh, Peter's uh, letters. We don't have that in our church. Can I, can I copy it? Now, he's going to carry this on his person, and you could be fed to the lions for doing this. Right around this time, within 30 years of this time period, in Lyon, France, read about some time in your church history, the tremendous persecution of Christians that took place during that time. Here's someone who loved the Word of God so much that they risked their lives to have it. And what's so wonderful to me is I could sit there with my modern Greek New Testament and look at that and just go back and forth. There it all is. 1,800 years later. Now, just notice the, uh, uh, down here you have the uh, uh, inscription. And I've sort of expanded it out for you there with the uh, unsealed text down below. Petru Epistole B. Epistle of Peter B or Second Peter. There's the beginning of Second Peter. So what you have on the facing page is the end of First Peter. So there's First Peter, Second Peter, written by a fellow Christian 1,800 years ago. And having translated, I can tell you, what you have in your Bible today reads exactly what he wrote 1,800 years ago. And the nice thing is, if you have a modern critical text, you can recreate exactly what's in this uh, from that modern critical text. We are hiding nothing from anybody at that point. Here's another, P75 from AD uh, 200, 175 to 200. P75 is of uh, Luke and John, uh, the Gospels again. Uh, and it, this happens to be an excellent text. The, whoever wrote this was, uh, had at least some, some uh, background because uh, it is a, a very, very uh, consistent and very well-written text. But again, upon uh, papyrus. Here's another important manuscript of the Gospel of John uh, and uh, other things. P66, also from around 175 to 200. And you can see here in this image, you can see that this is a book. You can see the codex form a uh, book like we would have. But you can also see that uh, time is uh, a little bit tough on papyrus, uh, given that its nature. And you, so you can see how some of the edges are, are, are frayed off. Uh, I think most of the books we own today would not look nearly as good uh, after 1,800 years, uh, especially if they're buried in the desert someplace. But uh, uh, this is a very, very important manuscript. And this is also why sometimes you'll be doing textual studies and and you won't find P66 or P75 cited, but it was cited a few verses before and a few verses after. It's because it's probably down at the bottom of this page here over on the right-hand side, and that part has simply broken off over time uh, and uh, has been lost to us. And so that's, uh, that's why that is. And here's another really important one. Here is manuscript uh, P46, also from around AD 200. Uh, but this one is from, uh, these are, is a collection of Paul's epistles. So very early on, Paul's epistles were put together in one collection. And uh, you can see what we have here is, I've sort of blown up that one section, pros Philippasius to the Philippians. And so there's the beginning of Philippians uh, right there on that particular page that you have in front of you, again, from around A.D. 200. Okay? So these are what the early papyri texts uh, look like. Now, going back to that, 
little church history. After the peace of the church in A.D. 313, remember, up until A.D. 313, the Roman uh, uh, Empire is persecuting Christians. And the worst period of persecution, after the Neronian persecution in the days of the apostles, uh, comes actually from about 250 to this, uh, this time period. So it was the last 60 years or so uh, which witnessed some of the worst persecution of that time period. But in th- A.D. 313, the peace of the church comes under uh, Emperor Constantine. At that point, Christians could have professional scribes copy the scriptures. At this time, the great vellum or leather manuscripts begin to appear. And one of the reasons we didn't have a lot of that beforehand is that, uh, face it, if you want to have a book, not too many Christians are rich enough to have enough cows uh, or pigs or anybody else in the backyard to go knock a few off to copy your book off. Uh, so you had to use the less... Uh, a lasting material called the papyri. So now the great vellum manuscripts begin to appear in history, including the three greatest of these, Sinaiticus, uh, which is symbolized by the Hebrew letter Aleph, Vaticanus, B, and Alexandrinus, A. In fact, my tie today is from Codex Alexandrinus, if you're wondering. And the reason I had this tie made is this is John chapter 14. And this is a tie I use to witness to Muslims. Why? Because John chapter 14 and 16 talks about the Holy Spirit, right? Well, Muslims believe that Muhammad is prophesied in the New Testament. And they believe that it is Muhammad who's being discussed in John 14 and 16. And that the Greek word parakletos, translated comforter, is actually a perversion. And that originally what it said was perikluptos, which means the exalted one. And the exalted one was about Muhammad. And so here is Codex Alexandrinus from about A.D. 350. And here's John chapter 14. And if anybody wants to see it later on, there is Parakletos, not Perikluptos. And this is 270 years pre-Hijra, before the time of Muhammad. And here's manuscript evidence that their assertions are not true. Aren't I a geek? Thank you very much. (laughs) Now, (laughs) hey, I've got a geek in the back. Yay, all right, good. We, need, we geeks need to, need to stand together. Now, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, uh, Aleph and B, may well have been among the Bibles copied with imperial monies at the time of the Council of Nicaea, around A.D. 325. We know that, uh, that Constantine gave money. The, church had been, the, the Roman uh, Empire had been destroying copies of the Scriptures for all that time period. And so Constantine gave money to the church to actually have professional scribes make Uh, copies of their Bible. He didn't tell them what Bible to do. If any of you saw the the silliness of the Da Vinci Code, uh, which was pure fiction and needs to stay there in fiction, uh, uh, Constantine had nothing to do with any of that, but uh, there was uh, a money given for the copying of of some manuscripts. And you can see, here's what Codex uh, Sinaiticus looks like from around A.D. 325. Uh, You can see it is a very large uh, uh, book uh, it is appearing online right now. Some of you may be aware of the fact that you can get extremely high-quality digital images of Sinaiticus by next June. All of Sinaiticus should be available uh, in high-quality digital uh, photography online uh, so you can examine any of, uh, any of its text because it's not just the New Testament. It's also the Old Testament in Greek as well. Uh, just to give you an idea of how uh, professionally done this is, uh, here is a page from Codex Sinaiticus. Look at the regularity of the lines, the regularity of the font. And remember, this is all handwritten. Uh, and uh, that looks a little bit different than the uh, papyri manuscripts that we were looking at uh, uh, earlier. Here's uh, an example of uh, Codex Vaticanus, uh, which is very similar and hence probably was copied around the same time as Sinaiticus. And as I pointed out in my tie, uh, here is Codex Alexandrinus uh, from about A.D. 350. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity in, I believe, 2005 uh, to visit the uh, British uh, Library. And uh, I was amazed. I was able to walk into the collections room. Uh, there, I saw no security anywhere. And I was able to walk right up as close as I am to my laptop right now. Here was Sinaiticus. Here was Alexandrinus. Behind me was a Wycliffe Bible. Next to it, a 1611 King James. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience for a geek like me. Uh, to be uh, uh, staring at these treasures of antiquity uh, that we have uh, preserved for us uh, to this very day. Now, 
Aside from the 5,500 plus Greek texts, we have early translations into Latin, Coptic, Sahidic, etc., that are important witnesses to the early texts of the New Testament. Combining these with the Greek text yields well over 20,000 early witnesses, handwritten uh, witnesses to the text of the New Testament. We have more than 124 Greek manuscript witnesses within the first 300 years after the writing of the New Testament. And folks, that is far more than any other work of antiquity. The, the vast majority of works of antiquity, 900 to 1,000 years between when it was written and our first singular copy. The idea of having more than 100 within three centuries is absolutely unheard of. Anyone who wants to say you can't know what the New Testament said, if they're consistent, will have to turn around and say, we don't know what was written by anyone before a printing press came on the scene. We've got no clue about all of history. If they're consistent, they won't be. But if they're consistent, that's what they're going to have to say. The only exception to that would be, well, if it was chiseled in rock, maybe, uh, you know, uh, then we'd be okay. But, uh, you know, that's about the only exception to, to that. In fact, we have 12 manuscripts from the second century, within, that is within 100 years of the writing of the New Testament. These manuscripts contain portions of all four of the Gospels, nine books of Paul, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation, comprising majority of the books in the Testament we possess today. Again, no work of antiquity even comes close to this early attestation. None whatsoever. Now, you may have heard, and in fact, even the way that Bart Ehrman presents it, it sounds like he's sort of likening the transmission of the text of the New Testament to the phone game. Remember the phone game uh, where you'd sit around a circle and uh, you, you would, you would, the teacher would, give, would whisper something in one person's ear, and then you're supposed to whisper it in the person next to him, and you're supposed to pass it around the circle, and then everybody laughs when it gets to the, the end of the circle. Why? Because it's been changed so much. In fact, sometimes it no longer even re- resembles what was originally spoken into the ear of the first person. And so what you'll hear is Bart Ehrman saying, well, you've got a copy of a copy of a copy. He likes to tell a story about, well, one person becomes a Christian because he hears it from this person. He tells his wife, and she tells somebody else, and she tells somebody else. Well, how does any of those people actually know that any of this actually took place? Well, you know, it's just this one single line of transmission, and it's been changed, it's been altered, blah, 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 blah. Is that how it happened? No, it's not. Let's take a look at how it happened in a graphic way. Here is the New Testament, well, the, the ancient Mediterranean world. And I've put a couple manuscripts up there. In fact, you've already seen these manuscripts. That's P72 and P52. And let's say uh, one, of the, one of the apostles writes, he's down in Ephesus. And so that one gets, gets transferred up and it, and it ends up down uh, the church in Jerusalem or something like that. That's where he's sent it to. And Paul's writing in Rome and, and that one gets, uh, gets uh, sent over to uh, the church at Corinth or something along those lines. Okay? And so you have these manuscripts are being written in different places by different people at different times. I'm emphasizing this for a reason. Stick with me and you'll see why. Well, but then people make copies and maybe they, uh, they send one off up this direction and one gets sent down to Carthage in North Africa and uh, down here in Palestine, we, we send that one up in this direction. And so manuscripts are beginning to move from place to place and copying is taking place. But then something important happens, and that is some of these manuscripts end up in the same place. And so now collections start being made as this process is going on. And so now you have a collection of maybe Paul's writings. And then that collection then gets sent up to this area and over to here. And a new collection, Paul's writings and the Gospels now, become put together. And a new collection over there begins to take place. What am I pointing out to you? that this took place over a wide area and over a period of time. There were multiple authors writing at multiple times, writing to multiple different places. There was never a time when one particular group controlled all of this. They never could have controlled all of this. This was a persecuted religion. You're running and hiding from smelly Roman soldiers. You hardly have time to be tracking down somebody else's manuscripts. 